Please be seated. Today is the great feast of Pentecost that ascended the Holy Ghost upon the apostles. Second, after Easter, this is the greatest feast of the liturgical year, celebrated by entire octave. During this week are the Ember Days, Wednesday, Friday, and Saturday, days of fast and partial abstinence, of course on Friday, complete abstinence. Monday and Tuesday Mass will be at 7 a.m., Wednesday at 6.45 and 8.30 a.m., Thursday 6.45 and 11 a.m., Friday 6.45 and 7.30 a.m., and 8.35 a.m., Saturday at 7.30 a.m. This Saturday will be the last time to pray the Regina Chaley. You can pray it at noon, and then after that is going back to the Angelus, because Paschal Tide then will have come to an end. The epistle is taken from the Acts of the Apostles. When the days of Pentecost were drawing to a close, they were all together in one place, and suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a violent wind blowing, and it filled the whole house where they were sitting. And there appeared to them parted tongues as of fire, which settled upon each of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in foreign tongues, even as the Holy Spirit prompted them to speak. Now there were staying at Jerusalem devout Jews from every nation under heaven. And when the sound was heard, the multitude gathered and were bewildered in mind, because each heard them speaking in his own language. But they were all amazed and marveled, saying, Behold, are not all these that are speaking Galileans? And how have we heard each in his own language in which he was born? Parthians and Medes and Elamites and inhabitants of Mesopotamia and Judea and Cappadocia, Pontus and Asia, Phrygia and Pamphylia, Egypt and the parts of Libya about Cyrene, and visitors from Rome, Jews also and proselytes, Cretans and Arabians. We have heard them speaking in our own languages the wonderful works of God. We stand for the Holy Gospel. Continuation of the Holy Gospel according to St. John. At that time, Jesus said to his disciples, If anyone love me, he will keep my word, and my Father will love him, and we will come to him and make our abode with him. He who does not love me does not keep my words, and the word that you have heard is not mine, but the Father's who sent me. These things I have spoken to you while yet dwelling with you, but the Advocate, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things and bring to your mind whatever I have said to you. Peace I leave with you, my peace I give to you. Not as the world gives do I give to you. Do not let your heart be troubled or be afraid. You have heard me say to you, I go away and I am coming to you. If you love me, you would indeed rejoice that I am going to the Father. For the Father is greater than I. And now I have told you before I come to pass, that when it has come to pass, you may believe. I will no longer speak much with you, for the Prince of this world is coming, and in me he has nothing. But he comes that the world may know that I love the Father, and that I, I do as the Father has commanded me. Thus far the words of today's Epistle and Holy Gospel. Please be seated. The Paraclete, the Holy Ghost, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. The solemn feast that we celebrate today is called Pentecost, coming from the Greek word Pentecoste, which means the 50th, or it is the 50th day after the celebration of Easter. It is the great feast of the third person of the Blessed Trinity, the Spirit of the Father and the Son who came down and manifested himself on that first Pentecost so many years ago. We will make the mission of the Holy Ghost the subject of our homily today, answering the following questions. Where and when did the coming of the Holy Ghost take place, and how did it take place? and what effects it did produce. St. Luke relates for us in the Acts of the Apostles the mission of the Holy Ghost which took place 
on Pentecost. The Feast of Pentecost was one of the three principal feasts of the Jews in the Old Testament. It was celebrated seven weeks after Easter, that is, 50 days. And this feast was instituted in Thanksgiving for the first harvest that had been gathered. And on this feast, the Jews offered up two loaves and the first fruits with great solemnity. Later on, the Jews also began to celebrate Pentecost in memorial of the law given on Mount Sinai to Moses. We see here clearly a type of the New Testament. So many things in the Old Testament foreshadow the brightness of the things to come, the greater things to come in the New Testament in which we are privileged and blessed to live. Our Christian Pentecost is, in truth, a harvest festival. For on it, Christ ripened the fruit, which is the Holy Ghost, by sending him down to earth. It is also the feast of the first fruits because on the first Pentecost were added 3,000 souls to the church, which was born on this day. It is also the feast of the law because on it the new law was solemnly promulgated. Christ said, I have not come to destroy the law, but to fulfill it. The laws in the sense are one, just as the God of the Old Testament is the God of the New Testament. The New Testament is the wonderful fulfillment of all the types of the Old Testament. For as the Israelites received the divine law after their delivery from the slavery and bondage of Egypt on the 50th day after their Easter, which is when they pass through the waters on either side of the great miracle of the parting of the Red Sea, they received the new law engraved on stone tablets, the Ten Commandments. So the new law coming from the Holy Ghost was inscribed by him in the hearts of the redeemed on the 50th day after Easter, burned on there with a spiritual fire in the hearts of men. On this day, then, the Jewish synagogue, the Jewish church ceased, and from it the Church of Christ marks her beginning, her birth. Christ had already founded the church. He promised Peter the keys from his open heart, his bride, Holy Mother of the Church, was conceived. But it remained hidden, so to speak, like a babe still in the darkness of its mother's womb under her heart. But today, Holy Mother of the Church came forth out of the hiding place of the cynical, out of the womb, so to speak, of our Lord, and celebrated her birthday proclaiming it to the world. And as we all celebrate birthdays in the world, because we rejoice that another human being is brought into the light of the world, so with great, great reason, we have to be joyful and to celebrate today the birthday of our Holy Mother, the Church, and return and give thanks to God, who has given us such a good and loving mother in the Church who has wonderfully preserved her, keeping his promises, and is always with his church to the end of time, even when she is suffering, as she is now in the wake of Vatican II. When the Holy Ghost descended, they were all together in one place, the apostles and the disciples. This place, of course, is the cenaculum, the upper room, where the Last Supper was celebrated, where the apostles were hiding away from fear of the Jews. The cenaculum was the most holy place upon earth, for here, of course, Christ instituted the holy sacrifice of the Mass and offered the first holy sacrifice of the Mass and made the apostles bishops, priests. The believers, 120 in number, 
who were assembled there, they constituted the Church of Christ. And hence St. Augustine says that in the Cenaculum at Jerusalem, the whole church was assembled and received the Holy Ghost. Now if the believers had assembled together in the Cenaculum and they constituted the Church of Christ and the Holy Ghost was diffused only on them, it follows that the Holy Ghost and with him the grace of true faith justice and sanctification can be received only in the Catholic Church, which alone is the true Church of Christ, which alone is that one Church founded by Jesus Christ. Hence, St. Augustine says, the Holy Ghost is only in the body of Christ, not in other bodies. The body of Christ is the Catholic Church, and outside of this divine body, the Holy Ghost enlivens no one. Let us, when we rejoice in the birthday of Holy Mother of the Church, rejoice too that we have been born into her bosom, that we have been incorporated into the mystical body of Christ through baptism, and may we ever remain faithful to the Church of Christ by holding all the doctrines that he has taught and that he has taught through the Holy Ghost, through Holy Mother of the Church. We read from St. Luke in the Acts of the Apostles that on this morning there was a sudden sound from heaven as of a mighty wind coming, and it filled the whole house where they were sitting. As our Lord said to Nicodemus, the Spirit blows where he wills. And there appeared to them parted tongues, as it were, of fire, and it sat upon every one of them. If you have a bonfire and you throw in it perhaps some sticks or things to burn and you scatter the burning embers, they will explode outside of the bonfire and will perhaps catch other things on fire. Wind and fire, these were the manifestations of the Holy Ghost. Also he appeared as a dove, we know, when Christ was baptized in the waters of the Jordan. We see together in God these wonderful things, gentleness and love, but also power and cleansing as of flame. The wind is swift, and so also is the movement of the Holy Ghost when he works in the souls of the apostle, when he works in souls who are attuned to his grace. Thus the Holy Ghost caused the Christian faith to be spread throughout the whole world very rapidly. In less than 300 years, Christianity had spread all over the globe. Tertullian said in writing to the pagans, We Christians are only of yesterday, and yet we fill your cities, your castles, your towns, your fields, the palace, the senate, and the bench. We leave you nothing but your temple. A windstorm manifests its great power, as we have seen recently with tornadoes in our areas this spring, but it plows through the sea to its lowest depths, it unroofs or casts down houses, and it roots up great trees and forests. But this is only a picture of that great power, which the Holy Ghost works in the church, and how he could overthrow all his enemies and propagate the faith and the church. The Jews and the pagans resisted this propagation. The apostles were persecuted, put to death, cast into prison. The Roman emperors left nothing undone, according to their human power, to extirpate this church of Christ. What had the Christians to endure during those first 300 years of persecution? What terrible tortures, sufferings of body and mind social sufferings, physical, spiritual sufferings. But all the exertions of the enemy of Christianity were in vain. It was turned against them. Not only was the church not destroyed, 
but she was like a vigorous apple tree, having been pruned back to the extreme. She came forth in greater blossom to give more fruit. Indeed, the blood of the martyrs was the seed of the church, and the seed was cast and spread far and wide. The sound from heaven came suddenly, and hereby it signified that the Holy Ghost imparts his grace from his liberality. For he is God, equal with the Father and the Son, the Spirit of both, omnipotent, there from the beginning with the Father and the Son. We have seen in many stories of conversions how he, in a moment, changes that sinner from a worldly-minded person into a saint, changes the sinner in a moment from a prostitute into a penitent and a great lover of Christ. That is the power of the Holy Ghost. As soon as he touches the soul, he teaches. To touch and to teach are one and the same thing. For as soon as he enlightens the human heart, he changes his desires. He removed what was once there and gives what was not. So writes St. Gregory the Great. The whole house was filled with this sound where they were all sitting together. They had completed their novena, praying in union with the Blessed Virgin Mary for the promised Spirit, for the Holy Ghost. And this sound filled the whole house. These words refer to the riches of the graces that the Holy Ghost dispenses for the church, so that in the New Testament we have truly been given in abundance everything that we need for our salvation. The word of, Christ, of God through Christ and his church, the holy sacrifice of the mass, the seven sacraments, so many indulgences, the example of Christ and of his blessed Virgin Mary, the intercession, the merits, and the examples of all the saints, the many sacramentals, blessings, and prayers, and exorcisms of the church. In a word, graces upon graces, which render it easy for us to obtain eternal salvation. So much easier than it was in the Old Testament. Let us today, with grateful hearts, thank our Lord for these abundance of graces and use them employ them for our salvation. The parted tongues that came down and rested upon the heads of the apostles refer to the graces which are given to the faithful through the Holy Ghost. St. Paul says, To one indeed by the Spirit is given the word of wisdom, to another the word of knowledge, but each according to the same Spirit. Another faith in the same Spirit another the grace of healing in one spirit, to another the working of miracles, to another prophecy, to another the discerning of spirits, and to another diverse kinds of tongues, and to another interpretation of speeches. But all these things, one in the same spirit, worketh, dividing to everyone according as he will. God is amazing, but we are limited as creatures. When we see a rainbow, we are amazed at these seven bright and wonderful colors in the sky. But all of those colors are contained together in the same light, that bright white light that comes from the sun. Yet each color blended together is a manifestation of that sun, same one white light. So it is with God. To us limited human beings, he gives these diverse manifestations Whereas in himself, in the Holy Trinity, in his substance, he contains all of these things, all these different graces and gifts, all of the riches, all of the powers, his gentleness and love, and also his wrath and judgment, all together in one being, in one substance. Here on this day, on Pentecost, Christ fulfills his promise. I will send to you another Paraclete, that he may abide with, abide with you forever. What a comfort to us to know that Christ promised 
his spirit to abide with the church forever. And even though those who hold steadfast to the doctrines of Christ in its entirety, unperverted by the heresies of modernism, although they may be few, we know and we hold on to this promise. The apostles were also few after our Lord's death, after the scandal of his passion, when so many Jews cried out for his crucifixion, there were only 120 in the small cenaculum, in the small upper room. And yet, in an instant, the Holy Ghost made these men so full of fire that they spread it to the four corners of the earth. So we must never lose hope, although in comparison to the conciliar of the Norris Ordo Church, we may be very small in numbers. But it doesn't matter if we are on God's side, God will be on our side. If we hold true to the teachings of Christ and do not compromise with the world or with the heretics, then the Holy Spirit remains with those, with those priests and clergy, with those small groups that hold true to the Catholic faith, unperverted. Let us take great comfort in this. <clears throat> in the old law, God frequently manifested himself by fire. To Moses in that burning bush, and to the Israelites in the desert by that pillar of fire by night. But the Holy Ghost shows that his descent on the day of Pentecost also the symbol of fire. And because the old law upon Mount Sinai had been given amidst thunder and lightning, for the reality was to correspond to the type. The Holy Ghost, however, did not give the new law amid thunder and lightning, but with the sound of wind and simply in fire. Because now the new law, not like the old law, was a law more dominated by love and not by fear. And for this reason, St. Paul, Paul the Apostle says, You have not received the spirit of bondage again in fear, but you have received the spirit of adoption of sons, whereby we cry, Abba, Father. Let us now speak of the effects of the graces accompanying the mission of the Holy Ghost. The apostles and the other believers assembled with them were all, as St. Luke says, filled with the Holy Ghost. The apostles had already, received, had already received him, the Holy Ghost, at their baptism and when Christ gave them the power to forgive sins in confession when he said, Receive ye the Holy Ghost. But the plenitude of the Holy Ghost had been reserved for this day of Pentecost. Today, then, they received, besides the increase of sanctifying grace, the seven gifts of the Holy Ghost, the gifts of wisdom, understanding, counsel, fortitude, knowledge, piety, and fear of the Lord. This Pentecost day was their confirmation day. It was the day they were made soldiers of Christ. Before, they were only recruits in training, still timid, still unprepared, for battle, still unprepared for this spiritual war. Now they burst forth, they sally out of their fortress to conquer the world for Christ. The Spirit and his gifts have cast out fear from their hearts. They received also the gift of languages began to speak with diverse tongues according as the Holy Ghost gave them to speak. And we can be utterly sure this was not the battle that the Pentecostals, unfortunately in our day, speak when they supposedly speak in tongues. That nasty and awful spirit which does not come from the Holy Ghost, but rather from the spirit underneath. These tongues were understood by men from different parts of the world. We know that the unity of this one tongue was lost when man in pride sinned against God in building the Tower of Babel to show their might throughout the world. And God came down, he said, let us split them, let us give them different tongues. And so 
came the different languages into the world, they could not understand each other, and the project of the Tower of Babel ceased. The Holy Ghost permitted the diverse tongues then, this disparity as a consequence of sin. But now, he enabled the people to hear what the apostles said, to understand each of them in their own tongue. And by this he indicated that all men are called to become one through faith and charity, which as one language unite all men into one family. So all Christians who love Christ, who love the Holy Ghost, who believe and practice the things that are taught by Holy Mother of the Church, whether they be in the United States, in Asia, or in Africa, or the other parts of the world, are united in that one language of love and faith. St. Augustine remarks that at Babel, Satan, the spirit of pride and the father of discord, divided the one and original tongue of mankind. But in the Cenaculum, by the miracle of Pentecost, the Holy Ghost restored this unity of language. And so we see also, too, the wisdom of Holy Mother of the Church, at least throughout the years, of holding on to one language in the Western Rite, the Latin language. Unity with all clergy throughout the world, where the faithful could attend Mass in China, or in Singapore, in the United States, or in Mexico, in South Africa, or in, or in Morocco, and it would all be in the same language, in the Latin language. This unity, this unity of worship, the unity of doctrine, which could be taught by this one language, which would not be perverted or adulterated by the general evolution that all languages break down or fall into. And we see how Vatican II then was very much opposed to this spirit of unity by introducing the vernacular into religious worship, into the Mass, into the churches. So now we have again this disparity of tongues. Now that unity is very much broken. And so we know another reason to hold on to the traditional Latin Mass. In regard to those who were witnessing this wonderful apparition at Pentecost as well as at Easter, which would have been, of course, the feast of the Passover for the Jews, pious Israelites came from all over the world. They had been dispersed through the captivity of the Assyrians and the Babylonians. Some were in Rome, but they all came back to Jerusalem to adore God in the temple and to offer sacrifices. Many of them remained ever after in Jerusalem to adore in the temple because they were pious and devout men. We have representatives of all the children of Noah, Sem and Cam, and Japheth, from Egypt, from Asia, Asia, and from Africa. Now all these people that were assembled heard the apostles speaking the language of their respective countries. They were amazed and wondered, for they were witnesses of a palpable miracle. And they said, Are all these who speak, are they not Galileans? And how have we heard every man in our own tongue wherein we were born? At the conclusion of the sermon, St. Peter now, full of the Holy Ghost, full of fortitude and wisdom, explained to them the nature and the miracle, and for the first time, preached to them boldly Christ crucified, so that 3,000 of them repented, converted, and were baptized on that day. These 3,000 were the first fruits that the Holy Ghost gathered. And the church will soon have a great harvest, and the words of the Lord will come to pass. And in the last days, the mountain of the house of the Lord shall be prepared on the top of the mountains, and it shall be exalted above the hills, and all nations shall flow into it. And many people shall go and say, Come, let us go to the mountain of the Lord, into the house of the God of Jacob, and he will teach us his ways, and we will walk in his path. 
For the law shall come forth from Sion, and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. So we see already in the birthday of Holy Mother of the Church, it is one holy Catholic and apostolic. It is one together in this unity of language, of love, of faith. It is holy, being made holy and cleansed by the Holy Ghost himself. It is apostolic, founded upon the twelve apostles now, who are ready to embrace their role, who are ready to go forth as Christ commanded them to, and to boldly proclaim him to all nations. It is ready Catholic, universal, in this day of Pentecost, for these different men dispersed from all nations now come together in Jerusalem, and you can be sure when they went back to their homes to the various parts of the world that they too said, we have seen this great miracle. We now believe in Christ, and they spread the gospel to their friends and relations. And so today, we see the great power and the mission of the Holy Ghost. Let us thank God on this day, this birthday of the Holy Catholic Church, for the great and unmerited grace that he has bestowed upon you by making you a member of this church from your infancy. And if you are truly grateful, then show yourself as good Catholics. Be zealous for the honor and the faith of your Holy Mother of the Church. Beware of giving assent to those who vilify her or scoff her ordinances or her doctrines and her teachings. Hold fast to them. Show your Catholic faith by keeping the words of Christ. By being a good Christian, being a good Catholic, being a good example, keeping your conscience undefiled, to make use of the means of salvation that have been given to us, prayer and the sacraments, and increase your devotion to the Holy Ghost, that he may increase in you the seven gifts you received at baptism and confirmation, so you may be truly a light to this world, a fire to spread and burn other people spiritually to make them also on fire for Christ. Pray to the Holy Ghost for the gift of fortitude, so we may outlive this darkness in faith and in hope, overcome the enemies of our salvation, and persevere to the end in the grace of God. Amen. May God bless you. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen.